Did Odo break One Piece again? Odo broke One Piece again. Yeah, Odo broke One Piece again. You just gotta love it when a chapter ends with a promise and the next one delivers on that promise, which isn't always the case in One Piece. What with Oda-san being a master at teasing us and leaving us hanging. But this chapter, we were served all right. We were served big time because this chapter delivered on promises big time. Last chapter's ending with the menacing promise of Jay Garcia Saturn's presence continued into this chapter's earth-shattering reveal of of the Gorosei's monstrous devil fruit form, complete with his own hype entrance that rivals some of the biggest celebrities in history. Quite seriously, this man had his own landing station, very much like an artist appearing on stage before their concert to the crowd's wild anticipation. Saturn appeared on stage in a very mystical and ominous way that went beyond the fantastical realm of devil fruits. It felt like dark magic or voodoo with the pentagram, the black smoke, very otherworldly. It's like he was being summoned when appearing as an apparition from that magic circle. I mean, we have magic now? If we do, it's the devil's magic because Saturn's form looks like a very literal take on the idea of a devil fruit. Because it is all but confirmed that Saturn does indeed have a devil fruit, that it is most likely a Zoan, a mythical Zoan at that, and that the form we witnessed in this chapter is most probably an awakened Zoan form. The dark cloud ring surrounding him, very similar to the smoke rings we've seen around both Luffy and Luchi, Awakened Zoan Devil Fruit forms, which also pretty much all but confirms that all the other Gorosei also have the same Awakened Zoan type powers. Something I can't get over and only actually noticed at the very end of the chapter is just how huge he is. Saturn is towering over the Alliance and is at least two to three times the size of Frankie, who isn't a small guy either. In terms of Saturn's power reveal, we don't know what Zoan form this is exactly, but he seems to resemble a spider in his lower half while he has horns like a bull on his head. To be honest, he looks like he could be Black Maria's grandpa. But the internet has told me that the inspiration for Saturn's appearance may have been a traditional yokai from folklore popular in Japan's western region, an Ushi Oni or also known as Gyuki, an Oni which seems to have been associated with beaches or other bodies of water. And fun fact is also the name of an attack that Zoro once used during his battle with Tebow. God rest his soul. You can't help but wonder at all the deeper potential meanings behind these worldly connections or all the other symbolisms, apart from drawing connections between the possible inspiration for Saturn's devil fruit design, the star imagery was very strong in this chapter, as well as the number five. The two obviously representing the five elder stars, as Saturn is the representative of the Gorosei here, and I don't think that the use of the number five is supposed to represent a ranking or a numbering system, as is often the case in other series, like your bleachers or your demon slayers, where the lower or higher the number indicates how strong a character is. But on the off chance that the number 5 associated with Saturn does in fact indicate his ranking, is he being assigned number 5, supposed to be that he is the weakest of the bunch, or the strongest, like 5 stars out of 5? Given his powers are the first that we're getting introduced to out of all the other Gorosei, you'd have to imagine that it's the former, and that Saturn may be just a taste of what the rest of the Gorosei are capable of. Even if the 5 itself doesn't mean anything in terms of ranking, Saturn as the first of the Gorosei that we're seeing in combat may mean that there's a reason why Oda has saved the rest of them for later, which is a really scary thought. But personally, I've always preferred and bought into the idea that the Gorosei are individually just as strong as each other, which is nothing to scoff at either, because having five individuals this powerful in an alliance all working towards a common goal is still a terrifying, looming shadow that keeps the world of One Piece on their toes. Saturn himself is so powerful. Imagine him multiplied by five. He's so strong that I genuinely question why he even needs to control the pacifista because I feel like he could take care of the situation here at Egghead without too much difficulty. Bringing the pacifista under his control is just a power play or maybe he likes to play life in easy mode. I may be thinking too deeply about everything at this point but I also wondered about his choice to seize the movement of the pacifistas as he made his entrance as opposed to reversing the order completely so that the pacifista could go back to fighting the alliance. Is it a tactical decision because the pacifista would have interfered in his way, maybe something to do with an energy output that would make it difficult for him to produce the magic circle to spawn out of, or energy that he wants to conserve so that he can repurpose it for his own means? Or is he really just a celebrity status diva and didn't want anyone's attention on anyone or anything else, so that all eyes would be on his grand entrance, or at least the eyes that he wanted to be on him, because not everyone was allowed to look. In fact, one of the lower ranking marines' heads exploded 
exploded after just making eye contact with Saturn for just a brief moment. I'm actually very unsure how to interpret what happened in that scene, so I would really like to hear your own interpretations down in the comments below. Initially, I thought of the Marine's combustion as something being similar to how Conqueror's Haki can knock out fodders, that Saturn's sheer dominating presence overwhelms those who are below Rear Admiral level, which is why they can't look at him, and that the Marine exploded upon meeting Saturn's eye. Or maybe that it's more close to how Luffy's awakened form allows him to affect his surroundings to turn rubbery, and so in Saturn's case, his spider-like form produces some sort of venomous substance or aura that people have to withstand, or even like Boa's Mero Mero no Mi. But reading it again, I also realized that it might not have been a subconscious or constant effect or aura that Saturn is just emitting by the sheer power of his devil fruit, but rather the marine dying might have been the result of a very deliberate action on the Gorosei's part. Because it also sort of feels like that Saturn may have attacked that lowly marine for looking at him, despite explicit orders not to, and because the marine witnessed Saturn in all his monstrosity, even explicitly expressing his horror, calling Saturn a monster. And so it was sort of as if Saturn was offended by the fact that such a low rank officer dared to gaze upon him, defying orders, and even had the galls to call him a monster. An unforgivable transgression that deserved punishment, which is also sort of fitting in terms of the Gorosei ultimately being celestial dragons. And it's actually quite funny to think about it in this way, because then, more and more, Saturn is turning out to be quite the diva. In all seriousness though, I know we're essentially saying this every week, but this reveal about Saturn's powers and abilities has really changed One Piece forever. Apart from the fact that, after who knows how many years, we are really finally seeing this scale of a reveal about the Gorosei. I can just see this leaving a mark on how to power scale in the series, as fans can use Saturn as another measure to power scale. Basically, anyone who's shown to be not affected up against Saturn will instantly become quote unquote above Rear Admiral level. So Bonnie and Vegapunk, both of whom directly looked Saturn in the eyes, standing up to him, they are confirmed to be at least Rear Admiral level. Which shouldn't be a surprise about Bonnie, considering she was fighting Vice Admirals in this chapter. But Vegapunk, well kudos and good luck to him, because Saturn is here to complete the mission of eliminating Vegapunk while his protector Luffy seems out for the count. Because we also saw the continued battle between Luffy and Kizaru in this chapter, and again, Kizaru just doesn't seem to be going all out. As an experienced combatant, he's able to tell how tired Luffy is, and while it's clear that Kizaru himself has been tested for the first time in probably a long while, I think Kizaru has more in the bag, and he could have ended this fight a lot earlier if he really wanted to go and fulfill his mission like he claims that he needs to do. Not to be remiss, we are introduced to another one of Luffy's new attacks, which continues on that solar system or constellation theme that we've seen as of late. This one is named White Star Gun, and it might seem like your usual weapon-like or gun style of attacks that Luffy likes to use, but what is very interesting is that idea of the star, especially considering the nature of Saturn's reveal and appearance in this chapter, and the overall theme of the Gorosei as the five elder stars. Now I may be reading too much into it, and maybe Oda just really wanted to continue that cartoon style stars circling around the opponent's head, but the speculations about the ancient mystical connections between Luffy slash Joy Boy to the Gorosei and perhaps even Emu and the planetary theme has already been discussed before, and I highly encourage you to watch this video if you haven't already, but Oda seems to be blatantly showcasing that connection to the planetary theme here. It's quite intriguing how we seem to have gotten that last bit of the fight between Luffy versus Kizaru in this chapter, because Luffy has reached his limit and was seen on his descent to the ground and in his descent into old age, but what's even more interesting is how Oda showed or last showed Kizaru in this chapter. It's unclear as to what status the Admiral is going to be in the next time we see him, because the last we saw of him in this chapter, getting hit by Luffy's attack which went through his head whilst Kizaru lamenting that this is a bad situation that he's in, as well as again the added effect of the cartoony style groggy stars around his head, it made it seem like it may be possible that we have a double knockdown on our hands right now. Although Kizaru quickly getting back up from this isn't as hard to imagine, whereas Luffy is seen depleted. And so with Saturn facing off the Straw Hats with the only one on the island who actually has any chance of doing something about the situation seemingly out of the fight, the tension is now higher than usual with the Alliance facing off the biggest threat that the series has ever seen without Luffy. So what's the way out of here? The obvious answer is still the Iron Giant, which typically we did not get an update on in this chapter, but I'm sure it's lurking in the background to come to the rescue unless Luffy maxing 
passing out his gift before means that the Iron Giant also ran out of juice. Bonnie stepping up and standing up to Saturn was cool, but mostly I think I was most surprised that Saturn actually bleeds. Overall, Bonnie was quite impressive in this chapter, taking on two of the Vice Admirals, and we don't know the name of Mr. Butchin yet, but we were formally introduced to Miss Bluegrass, Bluegrass who has the Ride Right fruit, which lets her ride and control everything she does. Bonnie's own ability was also very cool. The near-death experience attack which we were introduced to is a trick that I feel like would be a good attack that Usopp could be inspired from because it's very fitting with Usopp's attack style. But of course, out of all of Bonnie's scenes, the most intriguing is the ending and her recollection of what seems to be Kuma's memories. At least for me, I imagine what she's recalling is a piece of Kuma's memory that he experienced or witnessed while Vegapunk was turning him into a cyborg. And the conversation was between Vegapunk and whoever ordered for Kuma's cyborgification. The way that she stabs Saturn right afterwards suggests that it's out of vengeance, almost as if Saturn himself or at least the other Gorosei were responsible for what happened to Kuma, making the order themselves. But from Vegapunk's dialogue when seeing Saturn, it feels like they're only meeting face to face for the first time. His line of recognition seemed to be more of like a, oh, so you're Saturn. While the chapter was very heavy on the action and tension, there were also nice pockets of comedy that I really did appreciate. Like Sanji's Lady Radar, or Lady? Does that work? Lady Da? And not only Sanji's faith in it, but Vegapunk's too. Sanji's status as a simp is scientifically certified. I also really like the new quirky characters like the Butchin Rear Admiral. We also got to see cool inventions like the Vega Tank 8 and the special material Vega Clouds. These sort of technology being the appeal of Egghead Island. And given that Frankie got to witness it in action, I hope he leaves the arc very inspired. There was a notable absence of Robin and Brooke as the only two straw hats not featured in this chapter. And I have to say Robin's continued absence feels very suspicious. We also got a very cool color spread, a special feature on the Shimotsuki family. I imagine it's because the one-shot monster is getting an anime adaptation. Monsters being based on the sword god Yuma. So Oda's trying to generate some hype there. And it is working. And the best news for me was reading the chapter, getting to the bottom, and seeing no break next week. Because will 1095 elaborate on Bonnie's backstory and give us a visual of Bonnie's traumatic thoughts that we saw in this chapter? It would be a way to remove us away from the action to further stretch out the tension. But either way, whether the fight continues or we see the flashback next week, at this point, you take either of those options because they are both as equally intriguing. There has never been a better time to be a One Piece fan. And on that note, that's it from me. I'm sure that there is so much more I could say, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. So let me know by leaving a comment below. Don't forget to like, please subscribe, and thank you for listening to another one of my ramblings. Thank you to all of our Patreon and channel members as well. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.